from Wakefield. It's the Nolan Friday Night Show. We invite you to join Nolan and excuse me, Grant Wilson to the show for the 100th episode. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the show. And as we complete a significant milestone, the 100th episode, shortly before the anniversary of this podcast, who better to have on than my guest today? If you don't know his name, you've certainly seen his work on the big screen, but also on your television with stars from A to Z. Recently, he's released one of the greatest documentaries ever called Ryan Wilson, Long Promise Road, and his newest project, Send Me To a Gathering of Champions, which is on Peacock now to stream. It's a docuseries. I am both honored and privileged to have the amazing Brent No Relation Wilson all the way from sunny California for our 100th episode. Brent, it's a pleasure to finally get to talk to you. Uh, thank you, Nolan. It's an absolute pleasure, and congratulations on 100 episodes. That's you. uh, you're right. That's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, I, I sort of know what what you've gone through the last few years, obviously with the last two projects you did during the pandemic, particularly the um, docu series that's on Peacock, the about the Olympic Games in 1972. But besides that, and besides you know COVID and whatnot, what's life been like for you at this moment now to be able to look back on the last three years of craziness? That's a great question, and it has been craziness. It has um, it has been insane. It's been the the cr- th- craziest three years of my life. I got to say, um, <laughs> without a doubt, the making Long Promise Road was uh, a, a tough project. It was a really really difficult project to make, and then of course COVID hit, and we you know it was delayed for over a year. After taking all of this time to make it, you know, while we were making it, which we can talk about later, you know, Brian had back surgeries and all of these kinds of crazy things that made it, you know, delayed at making it. And then COVID hit and our film got postponed from Tribeca. Um, we finally hit the window where um, the film, you know, was out and was in theaters and we were getting great reviews. And I got COVID. <laughs> then I, you know, I was sick as all can be. And then, uh, yeah, then I had a little window where I, you know, made 72. Um, and then I got sick again. And so, yeah, it has been, in, long story short, it's been insane. <laughs> yes. During this process, though, I'm curious, have you found a moment, and maybe it's now, where you've been able to relax and take a deep breath from everything that you've been working on? You know, um, I, I have, I, I really have. Um, there, there was a there was a moment um, at at Tribeca, um, you know, where the Brian Wilson film debuted. You know, that one in particular because it was such a difficult film to get made and 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 to finally get out there. Where um, we had screened that day and we were in a bar that night and uh, was having a few drinks, and um, I was like, "Well, it's about midnight." You know, let's do a little quick Google and see what the review said. And uh, I think it was Variety or Hollywood Reporter or something like that that popped up first. And I read that first review. And from then on, I've 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 enjoyed the ride sure, since yeah. since that night. You know, but up until that moment when I saw that first review, because I just didn't know. You know, we were doing such a different sure. kind of film. Um, you know, just two guys driving in a car, um, you know, would people, you know, find that interesting and would, um, would people be able to read those silent moments in Brian's face and would they see the pain in his eyes and, you know, those things that I saw and those things that, um, I thought were moving, but I just didn't know if, if fans would or filmmakers would or, uh, critics would. And so, yeah, that. That night at midnight. Since then, I've <laughs> I've had a I've had a really good uh, that, and uh, I was very proud of Streetlight Harmonies. It's a small, sweet little film that um, that Brian is in, which yeah. is which is how I I met Brian um, because uh, the Beach Boys are very much a part of that doo wop chain. Yeah. You know, they're very much a, a link in that chain, um, and it's just a very sweet film that I was very proud of. And then 72, A Gathering of Champions. Um, wow, I mean, that one came together very quickly. It's a very emotional film. Um, it, much like Brian, it was it was just an honor to tell the story of these athletes, 10 Olympic uh, medalists, uh, gold medalists that we took back to Munich, Germany um, to uh, relive their experience 50 years later after the 72 Munich Games. 
And if anything, if anybody knows anything about, you know, the Munich games, um, 1972, if you hear that, you hear Munich, the first thing you always think of is the attack, yeah. you know, or you think of the Spielberg movie Munich, you know, which is all about the attack. And our goal was to try to put a spotlight on some of the stories that had been kind of lost to history. Sure. And, um, and so we were very proud that that, that turned out well. And uh, yeah, I'm ready to get back to work though. It's, <laughs> sure, uh, yeah. it's, it's time to get back to work. <laughs> sure, I sort of want to turn back the pages to basically page zero as best yeah. as I can. In terms of your youth, you know, thanks to Beach Boys Talk, when you went on there, you sort of talked about your childhood connection to the Beach Boys and how you grew up at that time when it wasn't necessarily popular to like the Beach Boys. Keeping the Summer Alive was an album. They had a few years after that, they had the self-titled 85 album, which is one of my favorites, person personally. Yeah. Great and song. A, a, a few other albums prior to that. Do you think at that point, listening to that music, growing up with them at that point, gave you a greater appreciation for making Long Promise Road? Wow, that's another really good question. I I think it, it has to have, right? Yeah. I mean, it's because the um, my fanship uh, was so genuine, right? Yeah. It, it, it came at a, at a time and an age uh, where you're so open to just anything, right? You're like you're open to anything is, but my, my theory is, is that if you're exposed to something good, you, you'll recognize it. Sure. You know, the human condition will recognize something good. They just have to be exposed to it. You know, sure. they've just got to hear it. And I was really fortunate that I was exposed to it. My parents listened to it. And, you know, it was, um, you know, there was no Disney radio and there was no, you know, iPods. And, and you know, so it was like you're in the car, you know, you listen to what your parents listen to. And, sure. you know, you didn't have your own stereo and things like that. You know, you listen to your parents' music. And so in a lot of ways, I was uh, I was really fortunate that way because I was exposed to some of the greatest music sure. ever made. And uh, so you're right. I think just being such a fan and, and that fandom coming so naturally really did, you know, make for just a greater appreciation. I never took it for granted. Sure. for one second that I was helping to tell Brian's story or that uh, our film would be a part of Brian's legacy. Sure. I never took that for granted for a second. I, I always felt like a hundred years from now, people are going to be watching this film because that's how important an artist Brian is. Sure. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I would tell the crew that all the time. I was like, you know, a hundred years from now, when they go to make the hologram movie, you know, of Brian Wilson, there will be another one, you know, they're going to look to this film. Sure. And uh, I, I took that kind of seriousness. You know, sure. I, I approached it with that kind of seriousness. Besides music, though, obviously, you, you're a, a filmmaker, producer. Growing up in Kentucky, one doesn't think that that's the mecca of filmmaking in the film industry compared to where you live today in L.A., so for you, growing up in that part of the, the country, rural Kentucky, what was that like in terms of your interest in film, but also your push to make film and try to get out there? Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. We were um, about 3,000 miles from L.A., but about a million miles from Hollywood. So, yeah, it, you couldn't be further away from, from that, the entertainment world. Um, but, you know, I grew up, um, at a time, it, it, it reminds me of, you know, there are so many bands, like if you, you, you talk to Bruce Springsteen or you, you know, you talk to, um, you know, Billy Joel or you talk to any of those guys and they, they can all tell you that, you know, I remember where I was when I saw, you know, the Beatles on Ed, Ed Sullivan and that explosion of talent that sure. came out of, you know, every band in the 70s and every artist in the 70s has that exact same story. Like I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and the next day I bought a guitar and, mm -hmm. you know, learned how to play. Yeah. I grew up um, in a time in the film business that was very much that way, um, which was I got to see Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, you know, in their prime as that 12, 13 year old kid. And it was very much that same thing. And there's a whole generation of filmmakers you know that are born out of that spielberg george lucas jaws star wars raiders of the lost ark mm -hmm. et you know era 
uh, that's really akin to, you know, uh, that air of musicians who, you know, saw and heard the Beatles for the first yeah. time and decided to pick up the guitar. So I saw those films and I decided to pick up a movie camera. And, um, and like I said, that's the story that you'll hear from a thousand bands about the Beatles. And it's a story you'll hear from a thousand filmmakers about Spielberg and Lucas. So yeah. they're, uh, I was I was that kid that at 13, you know, walked out of Raiders of Lost Ark and said, all right, I'm going to make movies. Sure. And uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, but I spent the rest of my life, you know, trying to make movies and I've never had a normal job. <laughs> I've, uh, you know, I took all my film school uh, classes, uh, senior level classes as a freshman because yeah. I made some pretty good films. Um, in, in high school, and I we talked them in. My friend and I talked them into allowing us to uh, make films as freshmen. And as soon as I finished that last film course, I was gone, <laughs> and uh, I was ready to start, you know, making movies. But of course, you know, instead you got to start making coffee, sure, and sure. Uh, so I did a lot of that. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, and even with those movies and, and those directors still standing to the test of time, I mean, you see. 40, 50 years later after New Hope still people, it, it's it's even bigger than it was then. You see Indiana yeah. Jones, they're coming out with another one next year with Harrison Ford at 80 years old. So even like music, it still stands the test of time because it's quality yeah. over quantity sometimes. Although those movies, there have been so many of them. Uh, you mentioned starting out, you know, making a lot of coffee early on in your career after completing your film classes. At what point, though, maybe maybe it was in high school, though, or maybe at early beginning when you're making those first few experimental films or movies, did you realize that your skills could take you seriously in the film industry? You know, I don't think I realized that until about a few years ago. Um, to be honest, it's it's something that I never, um, uh, you know, you, you always question yourself. You know, um, I, I think that's a common issue and a common problem, I think, with a lot of, uh, of people, artists. People who are of, you know, in the in the artistic world, you know, as you, you see in the documentary, Brian gets scared to death yeah. going into the studio, you know, when he's been in the studio a billion times and he still gets nervous. Um, I, I, I never at any point until really just a few years ago um, said, you know, uh, you know what, I'm pretty good at this. Yeah, you know what? I yeah, I can uh, I can do this for a living finally. <laughs> but it's even though I've been doing it for you know thirty years, um, you just I think as a uh, as an artist, you're always questioning yourself. You're always looking over your shoulder. You're always thinking, you know, is this good enough? Sure. Um, you know, are people going to like it? Are people going to accept my tastes? You know, or you know, this is what I want to see. Sure. You know, uh, but does anybody else want to see it? Sure. And uh, and that's a question that uh, I think you'll you know I think every artist asks themselves. Sure. You know, every, every single time. But but there does kind of come a point where, like I said, a few years ago now, you know, uh, you know, I'm in my fifties now, and I'm like, nah, I'm I can do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel much more comfortable now doing sure. it. Yeah. <laughs> I had Gary Griffin and Steve Kalinich on a while ago, and they talked about their dreams of, of being with the Beach Boys. That they, Gary told me I knew that I was going to work with Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. Stephen Kalinich told me that he knew he was going to work with Brian because that was one of his goals. For you, and you, you've you talked about uh, you know the America's Band documentary 1985 of the Beach Boys, how that was a, a milestone, a gold standard of stuff. David Beard's, Don Wass's were gold standards. And the first film I saw with the Beach Boys was their live concert in Nebworth in the early 80s on um on film i have the dvd which is what got me into them and what got me into yes. my love for dennis wilson but my question for you is similar to gary and stevie um was there any sort of on the radiator of, of your life or outlook of working or making something on brian wilson and the beach boys when you were growing up no never it never even occurred to me um the, the thought never crossed my mind the dream never entered my heart um it was one of those things that just seemed a million miles away um and um by the way going back to gary and, and those guys i love gary griffin he's just one of my all-time favorite people and the the fact that he's been with that band for so long and has had that love for brian 
uh, means the world to me. Yeah. And uh, I've become really good friends with Stephen, and he's such a kind and gentle man. Yeah. And how much he loves Brian, I, I, I just uh, having their friendship come out of this film has been has been a wonderful thing. But yeah, no, I, I never I never dreamed um, that that I could that I could do this uh, and work with Brian or be a a thread in his life and sure. never it never had even occurred to me I could go back to I'll tell you a funny story about the, the full house I was working uh, I was in Orlando um, I was a PA and um, I've you know I'm 21 or so so I'm not watching full house you sure, know what I mean sure. I'm, I'm I'm beyond the age of full house yeah. uh, but I but I knew that the band and stuff was associated that they'd appeared on the show and stuff like that Anyway, they had, there, had, there was an episode where the Full House family comes to Orlando and they visit Disney World. And I worked on that show. You know, I, you know, I was living in Orlando as a PA, production assistant. And, uh, you know, we're doing, that, we're doing that episode. I was hired to work on that as a local. And, um, you know, we're, we're shooting it. And I didn't know anything about Stamos and, and yeah. his love for the Beach Boys. And he's up there in front of the castle and he's, on the piano and I'm going, hey, that's forever. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's doing he's doing a Beach Boys song. He's doing this Dennis song that sure. he's singing, you know, in front of the castle. And then at a certain point I kind of looked over and there's Mike Love standing in the crowd. We had an audience. We had, we shot this at night when the when the uh, the Magic Kingdom was closed. Sure. And then we bring in extras who yeah. kind of fill it in and stuff like that. You have to shoot it overnight when the park's closed for all the cameras and stuff like that. And I look over and there's Mike Love, you know, standing three feet from me. <laughs> and he's just there with his family and kids and he's taking a vacation, you know, while Stamos is in Orlando. <laughs> and I was just like, holy shit, this is the closest I'm ever going to get to being with a beach boy. You know what I mean? This yeah. this moment. And I didn't go up to Mike or anything like that. Um, and and. I wanted to, but he was with his kids and he was yeah. with his wife. And so I was like, no, I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to be cool about it. But I was just thinking like, holy shit, this is it, man. Yeah. I'm standing next to a beach boy yeah. and uh, I'll never be this close again. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, then to cut to, you know, 30 years later and yeah, I'm helping to tell Brian's story. I'm helping to put together Brian's the soundtrack for the film and I'm yeah. selecting songs and I'm going over songs that brian's going to record and uh giving my two cents to brian and he's like yeah yeah that's a good song brent we should do that or like no 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 i don't you know i can't sing that song anymore and i'm like oh and this is unbelievable yeah, yeah, that, that, <laughs> so, yeah, but it was it was a it it was a dream that i never would have dreamt well a total pantry moment in both telling brian what songs he should sing in the studio but also seeing dr love himself in Disney World in, in Orlando, but flash forward many years later, the document or the, the movie you did, Streetlight Harmonies, again, a, a great piece of film, which is uh, uh, connected to the Beach Boys in, in more ways than most people recognize a lot of their songs. How important for you was it to share the story of some of these people in the film? Because seeing as, as it says in that film, that genre, that brand of music died off pretty quickly in the 60s as the Beatles come over was that a necessity necessity to you as a filmmaker to share the story absolutely yeah i felt a, a, an obligation a, a sincere obligation to tell their story and to try to help perpetuate that music and to um, have doo-wop music be taken seriously uh, as a genre and as an important piece of uh, of the rock and roll chain and um, when we came up with the idea, my partners and I um, came up with the idea to do the film. The first thing that I did was to was to kind of Google and look to see if anybody had done a documentary already on it. And I was shocked to find that nobody had. Oh, okay. um, and then that really reinforced the idea. And then particularly as I got to know, you know, Terry Johnson of the Flamingos and, you know, Jimmy Merchant uh, of the Teenagers. And you get to know these these artists and you, and you you see the sincerity in them and you see their just their passion yeah. for what they've done their whole life here they are in their 70s and and they've committed their whole life to to music and it hasn't always gone great and there's been ups and there've been downs and but you see that passion and and, and as an artist and as a person you know you want to help 
perpetuate that. And so, yeah, we did. I, I took that responsibility very seriously and I, I, I hope people discover that film and I, sure. I hope people discover that music. We were really conscious about um, using songs that maybe you've heard in a movie. Um, you know, I only have eyes for you or, you know, why do fools fall in yeah. love? You know, these are standard doo-wop songs. They're not hidden gems, you know, and the idea and the hope was is that somebody would watch this doc and they'll see it and they'll go, oh, I know that song. I've heard it in a commercial or yeah. I've seen it in a movie. I had somebody come up to me and say their favorite movie was um, uh, um, uh, uh, Adventures in Babysitting. And I guess in the beginning, Elizabeth Shue is singing uh, to do run run or something, oh, yeah. you know, one of the Chantel songs or something. And she goes, I had no idea who sang that song, sure. but I loved that movie as a kid. And now I love that song. And so it gave her a greater appreciation for, for the artist who created that song. And so that was, that was our goal was to put these songs that had been in, out there in the ether and put them in the, the context of, of important works of art. Sure. You know what I mean? That these are, shouldn't be just looked over and glossed over and even though it lasted a very short time you're going to find that you know in the beach boys you're going to find that in motown yeah. you know you're going to find that in the Bee Gees. you're going to find it in nsync you're going to find it in k-pop you know what i mean you're going to yeah. find it you know that this music has never really truly died sure. and that's yeah. that's what i wanted to tell um and yeah we did it, it, it it, it makes I'm very proud of that film. I'm very sure. proud that we got to tell those artists stories before, you know, before it was too late. You yeah. know, there's definitely a, you know, before it's like Barry Manilow is someone who, who has to do a documentary, yeah. right? You know, somebody's got to tell Barry Manilow's story before it's too late, sure. before Barry can't tell it, you know, yeah. and um, you know, that's another great example of, of an artist that you know, you don't want to see fall through the cracks. Sure. You know, um, he's a great example of somebody who, you know, uh, you could just maybe just kind of disregard, you know, oh, you know, oh, I like that Copacabana song. That's yeah. kind of funny. And oh, yeah, I know he wrote some jingles for some commercials or stuff. But, you know, that man's an incredible artist who sure. wrote some beautiful music exactly. and he's an incredible musician. And, and you want him to be taken seriously sure. and I mean you want his music to to be um, uh, respected as any other you know uh, music genius would be sure. and so I always try to do that that's I take this job uh, very seriously I take my responsibility I guess is sure. what I should say I take my responsibilities very seriously at the end of that documentary the do up uh, Streetlight Harmonies when Brian Al making an appearance at the end and you asked them about what their viewpoints on um, do it wasn't um, Al, you know, he sings Come Go With Me in his concerts. He sings yeah. it recently in, in his solo shows. What was, for you in that moment, was that a moment where you knew that I got Brian right here and if I just ask, ask him the correct questions that I could have him in a, his own documentary? No, not at all. No, it was, um, I, again, I just wasn't even thinking that way. You know what I mean? It just had, It just never occurred to me. I was just so excited to we, we interviewed Al first and I was just so excited to have Al and to be sitting down and and talking about uh you know come go with me and he also does she kissed me you know um the great crystal song uh, you know Al does that and it, it was just I was just such in the moment uh of of talking doo-wop with Al sure. <laughs> and uh, and just enjoying that and then later with Brian, you know, Brian's was very quick, um, you know, uh, as you can imagine, he just doesn't like interviews, sure, which I would yeah. discover the hard way, you know, <laughs> a few years later, <laughs> you know, how yeah. much he hates being interviewed. Um, so uh, because of that uncomfort uh, uh, that you could just feel when he's sitting across from sure. you and you're doing the interview, you could just feel how uncomfortable he is. All I'm thinking is, is I just want to get through my questions and, you know, get out of here before, you know, he throws a microphone at me <laughs> or gets up and stomps off. And then I learned, you know, of course, years later that, you know, Brian doesn't have mean bone in his body, but, sure, you know, sure. he's a big guy, by the way, yes. Brian Wilson's like 
six four, mm-hmm. you know, six five or whatever it is. Brian's a big guy, yes. <laughs> so yeah, he, he'd be a t- I would imagine, you know, in his day, he probably could have been intimidating too. There was a reason he was a quarterback and yes. the center fielder in high school. I think one of the big, you know kind of, you know, misconceptions about Brian is that, you know, he was this very gentle and sweet man for sure. But yeah, that guy was a quarterback in high school and and a sooner fielder. He was a badass. (laughs) And and he's proud of that. He's very proud of his athleticism. At at that point, you know, you probably at after that you say, oh, wow, I introduced him. There's an inkling that you may have in terms of, wow, there's been so many documentaries done on Brian, but it's up to a certain point. And you've mentioned before how how long, not long promise road, but Love and Mercy sort of ends when he meets Belinda, his current wife, and how there wasn't anything done after that. And you, that's what you want to do, share his, his next life, how he has all these kids now, how he's married to Melinda, and then he has his band, and now he's going on tour and all this fun jazz. That part, how did how do you come to that thought process of that's what you want your documentary to be based off of, but then also executing it is another thing? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a great question. I can't remember. I was editing Streetlight Harmonies, and um, and you know, I'm sure I was at that point. We were I was cutting Brian or something. You know, I must have been cutting Brian's interview. And of course, I'm a huge fan, and and, and I'm just sitting there thinking, going, you know what? There's a whole part of Brian's life that hasn't been told, and you know, because I had seen all the documentaries. You know, as a fan, I was very familiar with all of the films. And, uh, you know, opening weekend of Love and Mercy, I was there uh, at the Arclight Theater here in Hollywood. And, you know, I bought the tickets where Brian was going to be at. There was going to be a Q&A afterwards with Brian, um, you know, and I bought, uh, you know, I had tickets for that, you know, right up front, you know, just like, you know, any fan. And um, I just remember thinking is um, uh, uh, this, there's a whole but as Love and Mercy ended, and I was still editing Doo-Wop, but you know, I was still in Streetlight Harmony. It's like, yeah, there's Brian's life after that is is remarkable. You sure. know, it's it's and and it hasn't been told. You see a little bit of it in Don's film, I think, but you know, Don's film is also performance. Sure. You know, yeah. it's you know, you're getting the songs and things like that. Um, but you know, you're not seeing him on the road. You sure. know, and, and that and that kind of thing, and you're not seeing him. You know as he is you know as i what i was so impressed at is like here's a guy you know that i was saying you know at the time here's a guy at 75 doing what he couldn't do at 25. and i was so impressed by that yeah you know i was just so amazed by that but the moment where it all gelled where it all clicked and i said okay this is i've got to do this documentary was he was after love and mercy it was his birthday show at the greek he was playing the greek um, got some tickets, you know, on StubHub, nice tickets right up front, you know, fourth or fifth row, something like that. I was beside Melinda, actually. <laughs> um, I knew who Melinda was. I'd seen her at the arc light, you know, so I knew what she looked like. And um, I was, you know, a couple rows behind Melinda and the kids. And um, it was Brian's birthday show. And um, at a certain point, um the kids uh, they rolled out a cake all of brian's kids carney was there wendy was there you know all, all of the kids their his grandkids uh they all rolled out this cake and everybody from the greek sang happy birthday to him you know as he as he blew out this cake you know on stage and i would just i'll never forget no one just sitting there going how in the world did brian wilson get to this place in his life you know, how is it a guy who is just was so lonely and so broken and just, you know, terrified to perform and who had lost his brothers and lost his mother and lost his father. And here he is just the epitome of survival. Exactly. And he's surrounded by all of this love on stage with his family. He's got this incredible band beside him that's playing music as great as it's ever been played. Sure. And then he's got 19,000 people in the audience yeah. who are just absolutely in love with him. And there's Tom Hanks and there's Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. and 
There's uh, Dohani Harris, I think his name is, uh, George Harrison's son. And, and, and it's just like, and they're all, everybody's in love with Brian Wilson. Yeah. And I just thought to myself, my God, how did he get here? Sure. How? And I was like, that's the story I've got to tell. Yeah. That's, that to me is a movie. Sure. You know, how does that broken man with all put together those pieces to get to that place on the stage sure. where he's just <laughs> surrounded by love? And well, that's that's the story I wanted to tell. And you, and you see, there's a specific album that they did where it was him singing some songs, new material, but then it was him and friends. And you had she and him on the album, Sabu, a bunch of people on the album, yeah. and they're singing new songs. And it's like, yeah. it's like, see, that's what he does. He does that. You see, as of the last few years, Janelle Monae, he sings back up on her song. She yep. and him does an album on his older material and you vocals on, I forget what background vocals on whatever song was on that album. And it's like, he still has the hold on music and society today because he, he's such a huge thing. But also what I like about it, the documentary, when I mentioned to you, and I have to admit there were some scenes, and I'm sure you, you probably can guess what I'm talking about, where I could feel it in my gut, in my heart, and almost tearing up a little bit about some of the more tender moments in the documentary but what I like about the documentary is what you provide and what you've said is that it was made by a fan. It wasn't someone, let's say, doing an interview for some broadcast channel or some the BBC, whatever it was, where they're trying to get something out because it's in the moment at that moment. You and Jason are there and you're doing it as fans and you make them comfortable. Jason's and Jason has been with them for years, for Rolling Stone covering stories. How much ease after your struggles interviewing Brian one on one was it to have him to help complete this project? It was, the film would have been completed without him. Yeah, yeah it would have been impossible. Um, you know, I, I tried to, you know, interview Brian three times. Um, once it was just me and him, uh, audio only. I, I didn't even have a camera. And it was just me sitting across the, away from him. And we went to Studio 3 at Western, which is where Pet Sounds was made. And I had Mark Lynette, his engineer, engineering it and again just trying to make him feel comfortable no cameras and it just didn't go well yeah then i did another interview um where um i there it didn't make the film i think it might be on some of the dvd extras where i brought brian to capitol records and we rented out capitol records for the day and i set him down at a piano and then i surrounded the piano with i had gary griffin i had mark lynette I had, I think, maybe Darian, um, Gary. Anyway, I had four or five guys around the piano on sure. bar stools, and they were asking the questions. And then Brian, the idea with Brian would kind of play along, kind of ask the questions. And I would do, the idea was I'd do two or three different sessions in two or three different studios with different people. Um, that went a little bit better, but the whole time, Brian's just looking at his watch, you know, Brent, are we done yet? You know, Brent, are we done yet? And Brian, just five more minutes, you know, just five more minutes. Because ultimately what I discovered was it was, it was the cameras. It's the setting yeah. down. It's the lights. It's the focus. It's the attention that he's just uncomfortable with. And um, so I told this to Gene Seavers, his manager, um, longtime publicist. And Jean suggested that I talk to Jason. She goes, you should just talk to Jason. Jason's been interviewing Brian for 15 years. He'll have some advice. And so she set up a phone call. And before um, we did the phone call, I had reread Jason's Better Days, the article Better Days in Rolling Stone. And in that article, he describes driving around with Brian and he spends the weekend with him and they go to the movies, they see the wrecking crew, they go get a massage <laughs> together. If you've read the article, it's really funny. You know, the article starts out with Brian may be shy, but he's not shy about getting naked or <laughs> getting nude or something. Cause they go get a massage and sure. there's Brian, you know, just like, all right, let's go get this. And uh, it's a really funny article. And I asked Jason about it. I said, how did you get him so relaxed? And he goes, I he goes, hey, we just drive around. I goes, I'll just get in the car and we'll just play songs. And he goes, sometimes he won't speak. And I don't, you know, we'll go 20, 30, 40 minutes. And he doesn't say anything. And then he'll answer a question I asked, I answered him, I asked him two hours ago and he'll answer a question. And I said, you know, Jason, I said, that's the movie I want to see. You know, that's a movie. I, and 
I said, would you be up for that? And he goes, I love Brian. I'll, I'll do anything for Brian. He goes, I've never been on camera, you know, um, and I'll, you know, I, I, I don't think, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm Brad Pitt or <laughs> whatever. And, uh, and he goes, and he goes, and he goes, sometimes it can take a long, long time. And I said, well, don't worry about that. You know, the old adage is tape is cheap. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll worry about that in the editing bay. And so we flew Jason out uh you know three or four times from new york um where he lives and works on rolling stone and um we shot like i said over 70 hours with him and and, and brian just driving around sure. and um you know there's no cameras in the car i mean there's no camera operators in the car yeah, there's yeah. no producer in the car you know there's no lights it's just um that's my little my little dog lily <laughs> <laughs> who's also a beach boy fan <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it just, we just captured Brian just driving around with Jason. I had the cameras fixed on the cars. I had the audio fixed so they wouldn't have to wear a microphone because I didn't want him to wear a mic. Um, and my hope was, is that about 10 minutes into it, I, he would forget that the cameras were even there. Yeah. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> and um, it just becomes two buddies, sure, you yeah. know, driving around playing songs and and talking and that's something i think everybody does and everybody can relate with and you know and there's just uh you know uh, it's just a great feeling right when you're sure. with your best friend yeah. uh one of your good friends and a good song comes on the radio it's just yeah. a great moment you know sure. and uh and i think that's what we captured and, and sure. brian was completely relaxed and and had fun he enjoyed it i mean he had a blast i would you know i still see brian all the time and and i've kept in touch with him and and every time you know i see him you know he's like brian i had so much fun making that movie wow. you know it's the most fun i ever had you know doing that kind of stuff and, and and we just had a good time making it and that was the point was to make him feel relaxed and uh, and to do it and but we couldn't have done it without jason what i like as i mentioned to you multiple times is, is is the personal personable part about the documentary and how you make that and there are moments in that the, the deli scene where he talk he's talking with jason and and you had picked up the bill for it whatever it was and he says i haven't had a friend like this for years that's a very hard you know wrenching thing another scene was you know him talk him going to carl's house with jason and hearing about jack riley's death and certainly the pacific ocean blue part and I say the Pacific Ocean Blue listening part is because it, it's a subject for Brian that he doesn't like to talk about a lot because obviously it's a heartbreaking thing. He recorded music with them and Dennis was Brian's biggest supporter ever out there besides his current band. And and I, and I so I say this as a fan, big fan of Dennis. Thank you for that because there aren't a whole lot of documentaries out there that share that aspect besides Dennis's BBC documentary. And that was a moment where it really grabbed at my heart because it's like, there he goes, Brian, Brian's, you know, baby brother, Dennis, and he's listening to the song. He's saying, all right, that's some that's good stuff. Good. And then to hear that he listened to the entirety of the album and the poor camera operator had to record the on handheld the entire time made it even better. For those moments, though, the ones I just mentioned, those heartbreaking moments, was how vital to you was it to include moments like that to showcase what Brian's still like today? Yeah, it was everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, even moment like you talk about the moment where uh, we're in the deli and I go to pay and Brian says, you know, I haven't had a friend to shoot the shit with, you know, I just scored a friend and I haven't had a friend to shoot that that scene, you know, it's it's really sloppily shot, you know what I mean, the, where they were done shooting, you know, I'm going to go pay. You know, I walk in front of the camera. Yeah. Um, you know, you just see like a, you know, my back and like half my ass, and <laughs> you know, and you don't know who Brian's talking to, and and all of this, and it's you know, it's not, it's not a pretty scene. It's not something that you would normally put in a film, but it's so emotionally raw yeah. that uh, Hector Lopez, our editor, and I, we were like, that scene's got to go in the movie. Yeah. I mean, it's just, even though it's just a visual mess um that moment of brian saying i you know i haven't had a friend you know to shoot the shit with and i just scored a friend and he says jason says i'm there for you and brian says i'm there for you too yeah um i was like we gotta we've got to include that moment and so um I, 
my, my Hector, my editor, we just, and Jason, we all made a promise, an eternal promise that we would just make this film as honest as we could. Sure, like sure. there was no sense in, in trying to um, make Brian out to be any more than he is. Because sure, sure. for me, the, the greatest part of Brian's story is in this last 30 years or so is his strength. Yeah. It's not his voice. It's not his strong writing ability. You know, his greatest asset has been has been his strength, yeah, you know, yeah. and I, I just wanted to show what it was like to walk, you know, in Brian's shoes, you know, walk a mile in my shoes, you know, that you know, that old saying. And and I think, you know, in those moments, those really raw moments where you see Brian scared you see Brian opening up and revealing himself in ways that are just so raw. Yeah, it yeah. gives you an insight of what it's like for Brian every single day. Sure. You know, when he says he's, when he's at the deli and he asks Jason, what do you do when you get scared? Yeah. You know, like he's just sitting there with his friend at a deli and he's scared yeah. and he doesn't know why he's scared, but he's just feeling scared. And uh, that to me is heartbreaking because yeah. that's what it feels like for him every single day. And yet every single day he gets up he gets dressed and he tries to put himself out there sure. in the world. And uh, that was the story that I thought, you know, man, uh, we've, we've, we've got to, we've got to let fans know, you know, what, what it's like for, for Brian as painful as they are to watch sure. and they are uncomfortable and um they are really uncomfortable moments and um the day that we pulled into the, the very famous scene uh cameron crowe paid me a compliment and said it's the greatest scene he's ever seen in a documentary any documentary and uh you know cameron crowe said that uh, you know you take that to heart yeah. one of my all-time favorite filmmakers almost famous and jerry Maguire and and um but it, the moment is is where we long promise road just happens to be playing brian asks to hear it because he had asked to hear it he had it's okay several times and, yeah. and long promise road several times he, these, these songs he keeps asking to hear that make him feel better and he happened to ask to hear long promise road just as we were pulling up uh to carl's house and we wanted to go back to carl's house because that was where they had, uh, you know, for the American band had shot Brian's birthday party yeah. and Paul and Linda were there. And then that same day, that's the very famous photo of Brian um, in the bathrobe holding the surfboard. They did that that same day. And then he also shot the, the, uh, the, the, the Belushi Dan Aykroyd skit yeah. all in that day and all from that house. And then the Paul McCartney comes over. And so it's a pivotal kind of moment in Brian's life. And so we felt, even though, you know, it's Carl's house and, you know, of course, uh, you know, we don't know who lives there now, but we should go to this, visit this house and see what kind of memories it brings back for Brian. And we pull up and the song is playing, Long Promise Road is playing on the radio. And um, I, he, as you see in the movie, he says, I don't want to get out of the car. Uh, and Jason goes, well, hey, look, I want to get out. I want to kind of go see it. And uh, so I can hear I'm listening. I can hear that Brian doesn't want to get out of the car. So I'm like, okay, that's okay. So, but I jump out because I'm talking to Jason now and saying, all right, where do we want to go next? You know, hey, does, did Brian say if he where he wants to have lunch or you know any of that kind of stuff? And we're just doing logistics, you know. And it's like, oh, how are we going to turn around? You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're outside for 10 minutes or so and brian's just sitting in the car by himself in the air conditioning and i don't think anything about it yeah um and then i don't know five months later whatever it was six months later um we go to edit you know i'm in editing and um, my post supervisor comes to me and goes have you seen the footage from inside of carl's house and i go no no i haven't seen it you know i i had you know i had what they call dailies you know, where I'm watching the footage, but when it got to that particular scene and Brian's just sitting in there by himself, he's not talking to anybody. So I fast forwarded through it. I didn't, you know, I didn't even spot it. You know, it's like, oh, he's just sitting there. Yeah. There's nothing. And she goes, you really should watch it. And when I saw it, I just broke into tears sure. and um, it, it just killed me. You know, when Brian's in there 
And anybody who hasn't seen the film is he's he's listening to Long Promise Road and he's just staring at the radio and the song that's coming out and he's just taking in this song and and he's crying and you know the tears he's wiping away the tears and it's just heartbreaking sure. you know to see Brian in that way and and so vulnerable and so raw and uh, yeah I was just devastated that sure. day I, I was just devastated that day and. The day that we, the, the Jack Rowley scene where he, you know, we, Jason inadvertently told him the Jack Rowley had passed and he didn't know. I heard that though. I, I could hear that, you know, and I'm yeah. in a car behind him and I could hear that. But all I kept thinking about was Jason, <laughs> was how bad I felt for Jason. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't see Brian. I didn't, you know, I, I could hear him, but I couldn't see him. So I didn't know what Brian's face was, but I could only imagine what Jason's sure. face was because there was so much silence yeah. after that. Yeah. And then I could just hear Jason's voice. He's just heartbroken. He's just, I'm sorry. I thought you knew, you know, mm -hmm. I, I thought he knew. And so, but I didn't know visually how, um, how devastating that was on Brian until, until we got into the Edney Bay and, and I, and I saw that footage, but it did, it became very important. Long story short, it became very important yeah. to include those kinds of moments and, and show Brian Wilson for who he really is. It was important for fans to know, uh, and for future generations, uh, uh of, of, you know, uh, filmmakers and writers that, you know, this is Brian Wilson in his, in his seventies. This is, this is who this person really is. Well, I think that also replicates in itself in the, the the moments where you have the other artists from either his period or after him speak about it. And that's something also I like, in, which I didn't think about while watching it, but you sort of do, but not really think about. It. And you mentioned it in other interviews, all these people that you have interview or you're interviewing or whoever may be interviewing them about their take on Brian's music, they all have a different perspective from it. Uh, yeah. Mr. Jonas, younger guy, similar to Brian is, successful immediately and then sort of has to backtrack and has you know not a downfall but not as a bright moment and then he comes back you see bruce springsteen and you see elton john of course it, it, it's it's so amazing to see these things for that um, situation i'm sure there are people that you want to have on just you couldn't get logistically but for you what was it like to sort of check off the boxes of being present with some of those stars to hear what they thought about brian's music oh that was fantastic yeah everybody that we went after uh, pretty much said yes. There are only people that did that said no. There was a couple of people that said no. Um, I won't say who they were, but yeah. they said no because they were intimidated by Brian's music sure. and they didn't feel like they could articulate it. Sure. And I, I had two or three artists say that, yeah. uh, which I thought was fascinating. You know, and these were very established, respected, yeah. Grammy winning artists who sure. said, you know, Brian's music is too intimidating. I cannot express yeah. verbally what his music does. Yeah. And um, so that was and the other one. I wanted to get Drew Barrymore. I wanted to get Drew uh, because, you know, I wanted somebody from the film industry because I think, you know, Beach Boy music and movies is always yeah. so great. And it's a great way to discover, you know, movies in general are a great way to discover music, you sure. know, that you're not familiar with. And, uh, you know, Scorsese has been doing it forever and Cameron Crowe, you know, it's now become an art form. American Graffiti for me yeah. was, was, was what led to my love for doo-wop when I saw American Graffiti as a kid. After Star Wars, I went back and discovered American Graffiti and I was like, wow, this music is great. <laughs> so, you know, I know the power of, of music and film. So I wanted somebody from the film industry, Cameron, we asked Cameron and Cameron's like, eh, you know, I, I really need to be less on camera these days. You know, I want to focus on, you know, uh, at the time I didn't know it, but he was working on the play. He was uh, writing the, the the almost famous play, sure. Broadway play, which is opening next week, actually. And uh, he was having a tough time with that, apparently. And uh, but I wanted we wanted Drew Barrymore because, you know, she uses Brian's songs in pretty much all of her films. Yeah. And uh, uh, 51st Dates is, you know, the way she uses Wouldn't It Be Nice is yeah. so lovely. But uh, we just, she was doing a daytime talk show at the time and we just couldn't, you know, we just could never coordinate schedules. Sure. So that was the only one that I say we didn't get would be Drew that, sure. I, that I really kind of wanted. But everybody else said yes. And yeah, man, there's nothing cooler than something, you know, in front of Bruce Springsteen 
and uh you know talking about brian wilson <laughs> it's just you know uh, what can you say you know you're sitting down there and i, I treat these uh my interview style is is very conversational you know, I try not to look at my questions. I try to have my questions already memorized or have them written down very large, you know, so that I can just kind of glance down at them. And I try to do this in a very conversational way. Sure. So it's just me and Bruce shooting the shit about Brian for an hour, you know, and uh, that's pretty amazing. And, you know, same with Elton. And, you know, those guys couldn't have been more gracious and more respectful with their time and I could have used everything Bruce Springsteen said you know in our one hour interview in the film and I could have used everything Elton John said everything Jim James said because they were just so articulate sure. and they had such a great handle on Brian's music and why it works and what it is and yeah. and their passion and their love for it I could have used every single moment from uh you know from their interviews and they killed me to leave some stuff to leave sure. stuff out you know so yeah now those were some pretty epic days yeah, yeah i'm not gonna not gonna lie mentioning earlier the documentary you the docuseries i should say you did on peacock which as i said is available now on peacock or on the olympic website i believe is, yep. is something for you i said refreshing i'm sure it is for you to talk about something that's completely different than music from a, I don't want to say fan perspective, but sort of reiterating that point of refreshing and completely different, what does a project like that do for you as a filmmaker? You know, the, the, the biggest thing that's come from these, these last three documentaries that I've, that I've worked on, you know, starting with Streetlight Harmonies and then Brian, and then the exact same thing happened in 72. The one thing that I, that I, that I walk away, that I've been very fortunate to walk away from, the, the experience been able to walk away from is that I've become friends. Sure. You know, I count now these people as my friends. You know, Mark Spitz is the greatest Olympian in the world. You know what I mean? And Michael Phelps has the record now. He broke Mark Spitz's record. You know, um, for those who may not know, Mark Spitz won in 72. He won seven gold medals and he uh -huh. won and he broke seven world records. Mm -hmm. And that stood for 35 years until Michael Phelps won eight gold medals. But and 72, you know, uh, you know, it was just Mark Spitz and his, you know, and his coach, yeah. Michael Phelps has a trainer a nutritionist, a publicist, an agent. He was already a millionaire. Mark Spitz is worried about getting back to dental school. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's like comparing Barry Bonds to Babe Ruth. Sure. It's, you know, uh, Barry Bonds may have the home run, but Babe Ruth will always be the greatest sure. baseball player, you know? And so, Mark Spitz will always be the greatest Olympian of all time. So to say that Mark Spitz, you know, Mark, I got sick and, you know, and, and Mark Spitz calls and checks in on me. Uh, how are you feeling? How are you doing? You know, his, his wife sent me candy, <laughs> you know, and every time I see Brian, I tell him I love him. And he says, he, you know, I love you too. And um, uh, the, and there's so many people from, you know, Terry Johnson and Jimmy Merchant, um, you know, from uh, from the doo wop doc, you know, I see them and we hug and you know, you you weave yourself into their lives and they weave into your life. And so for me, that's been the biggest honor. That's been the biggest takeaway that uh, for me personally is that sure. how the heck does does Brian Wilson, you know, or Mark Spitz become friends with you know this kid from Kentucky? <laughs> You know what I mean? It's yeah. just how is how does this happen? You sure. know, and I consider Jason Fine that way. I mean, Jason Fine is like a brother to me now. I yeah. love Jason, and you know, this is one of the greatest writers, music writers of all time. Sure. And he shepherded, you know, one of the, the the magazine, and you know, Cameron Crowe emails me and tells me how much he loves my film. I mean, that's like the the sixteen year old little boy in me from Kentucky is constantly amazed sure. by those kinds of things and so i i take those experiences and i take those moments and and that those are the moments that sustain me and keep me going and um because uh, there's certainly easier ways to make a living sure you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't recommend documentary filmmaking for you know anybody aspiring to be a millionaire sure. <laughs> 
you mentioned that I either was at the beginning of our conversation here or before we got going here about sort of the backdrop story of the 72 Olympics and what had happened during that time and how it sort of overshadows the stories you're sharing. And that situation, a, a dark moment in history, not just in sports history. How do you con- how do you go about conveying these stories uh, on, on the screen on, in film, but also trying to get these people to talk about their moments, their remembrance of these times during those weird times? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, uh, the first part about, you know, uh, um, how do you do it? it you know, how, or what is it that, you know, how, how it's captured is you, you want to treat it with respect. Sure. And um, you want it to be personal. Um, so in 72, when we talk about the Israeli tragedy, which is what we're talking about in 1972, uh, during the Olympic Games, uh, the PLO, the Palestinian Liber- Liberating Ar- Ar- Organization, PLO, people, I can't read, anyway, <laughs> Palestinians, uh, terrorist group, um, uh, took several Israeli ho- uh, athletes hostage, um, and all of them ended up getting killed. They killed two or three instantly, um, two managed to escape. Um, and then the rest were killed in a botched um, um, recovery. Um, and uh, it's the darkest moment in Olympic history. Uh, like I said, Spielberg did an, you know, an entire film on it, um, you know, just called Munich. And if you've not seen it, it's, it's just a gut-wrenching film to watch. Right. You know, it's during Spielberg's dark period. Um, and um, what we did the way we approached that attack, that tragedy, um, there was only two survivors. Um, we brought one back to to Munich, and all we wanted to do was to hear from the athletes. Sure. We, we, we weren't concerned with an historian's perspective. We wasn't concerned with a newscaster's perspective or somebody who wasn't there you know we we just wanted that personal perspective of the athletes who experienced the moments themselves and i feel like when you can do that that makes for the best kind of film sure you know um sometimes you got to bring in the historian you know i mean you've got to help fill in the gaps you know you you have to do that um you know ken burns does that very very well because there's nobody left from the civil war (laughs) you know so uh, that's what you've got to do. But if you have, in my opinion, if you have the opportunity to not bring that in um, and have the story told from the first person perspective of the person living it, um, it's always going to be personal. Sure. Um, and and it's always going to be, it, and it never has to be right. Sure. You know what I mean? I did the same thing with the Brian Wilson doc. I had some people come up to me and go, oh, but you know, Brian said this, but I know and read that he said in 72, you know, he had yeah. done this and I'm, and I'm like, look, you know, I don't know, but in Brian's yeah. mind, sure. this is how he remembers it. Exactly. You know what I mean? Somebody came up to me and said, no, Surfer Girl wasn't the first song he wrote. It was, you know, it was surfing and he says it's Surfer Girl or something. Yeah. I can't remember, but it's like, look, that's not important. Sure. What's important is this is the way Brian remembers exactly. it. And um, so I'm always concerned whether it's right or wrong or historically correct or they get the dates wrong but just personally what are they how did they experience that and that's what we did with 72 you know we took these uh we took these 10 athletes back to munich and we had them walk the grounds and walk into the olympic village and go to uh the dorm you know where the attack had taken place and you know tell us their experiences what do you remember what were you feeling and and at no point do you bring in the historian to kind of contradict that sure, right sure. and you just keep it in that perspective and then the way that i try to capture those stories you know whether it's a, with the world war ii veterans or the doo-wop or it's all the same thing for me is you got to make them feel comfortable sure you know you've got to um trust has to be earned sure. you know what i mean nobody's going to come into an interview um and and trust you and i, I tell you what especially on the doo-wop doc because all those African American artists were ripped off by whitey. Exactly. You know, I mean, it was you know it was the white man who you know stole their royalties, and you know here's another white guy asking them questions and wanting to tell their story, and you know it's 
you know, you've got to earn their trust. You sure. know what I mean? You've got to, um, and that's just done through a process of phone calls and, and hopefully night dinner the night before, um, lots of emails and, you know, just hopefully gaining their trust and letting them know that you're genuine about telling their story. Sure, and, sure. um, if you can make them feel comfortable, um, you're, you're 90% there. Sure. You're, you're, you're 90% there. Before yeah. we go, and again, I can't express my gratitude for you being so kind with your time to do this. I want to end on a little game called the one word challenge. So in this game, I'll throw out a few names of people, places, or things that have some connection to my guest being the only Brent Wilson. And he has to do his best to say a word or two or a sentence that best comes to mind when he hears the phrase. So are you ready? All right. One word. Yeah. One or two or whatever comes okay. to mind. Uh, first okay. one, Kentucky. Glad to be out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Los Angeles. Home. Brian Wilson. Love. Fred Paris. Love. Uh, documentary film. Passion. Uh, success. Individually. <laughs> and last but certainly never least in this cosmic universe we all live in called Earth, Brent Wilson. Just trying his best. <laughs> <laughs> trying his best. <laughs> that's, that's what we can say. Some people have, have said, as, as the masqueraders say, just an average guy, but we're, we're doing our best to survive as J uh, Jackson Brown sings. Well, Brent, I want to say, again, thanks for taking the time to do this. It's been a, a treat to talk to someone who has a lot to say in, in the world of film and production and has put out my one of my favorite films that I've seen in, in a, quite a bit of time. So again, thanks. No, thank you, Noah, and congratulations again on 100 episodes, thank and thanks for your patience, and, uh, you know, and, the, and getting us, I know it took a little while to get us here, and but I've, I've really enjoyed it, and uh, I, like I said, I, I love talking to Brian's fans, I, I love knowing that the people are responding to the film, and yeah. it's why we do the job, and um, it just, it does, it means the world, and hopefully I'll run into you on a concert out yes, there, we yes. got to get, got to get Brian back out on the road. Yes. And I know he's dying to get back out there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, hopefully I'll run into you, you know, run out exactly. to you at a show someday. Or I come out at West because I know Brian always says, or Al always says that this is the last time we're coming to this part of the area. And, yes. they've, come, and, and they've come to the Northeast the last few years. So I say at some point they're not going to come out here. So might as well enjoy it. Um, if you enjoy it, what you sink us, who the heck wouldn't? And when my guest this week wins an Oscar for his next greatest film work, you can say, holy shit, I should have subscribed and followed back then. So uh, subscribe, follow, comment, share all that fun. Just follow on Twitter, Nolan Carr at Night Show. And, uh, no, Nolan Carr at Night and Instagram, Nolan Carr at Night Show. And um, my guest, Brent, is there anything that you'd like to put out and share and let everybody know about what's going on? No, I, this has been it, man. This has been fantastic. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. I know Brian loves his fans. He, you know, he, we did a lot of press together um, and Brian just loved doing it. And, you know, talking, knowing that his fans are out there, I'd come to him and tell him, hey, you know, I'm talking to this magazine or these people and he gets, he gets excited. <laughs> and I know you know, for people who see Brian in concert and he looks scared and we know it, but he loves his fans sure. and he loves being out there. And just a few weeks ago, he was asking Gene, when are we going back out on the road? <laughs> wow. You know, so uh, awesome. that is, I, I, you know, that though, I'll, I'll leave you with that. Brian awesome. cannot wait to get back out there. He loves his fans <laughs> and he loves, it may not look like it, sure. you know, I know it may not look like it, but he does, sure. you know, he really, really does. He loves being out there and he loves, he loves his fans. And he, he loves hearing that applause, even though right after God, I only knows he's going to tell you to sit down, yeah. <laughs> you know, every time he yes. gets a little nervous, but he does. Well, in the words of Johnny Carson, the king of what I'm doing right here, I bid you a heartfelt good night till next time. Take care. <laughs>